All right. Well, <laughs> welcome to um, the Eastern Question Lecture Series, class number six. This may well be, this is scheduled to be the last of this series. Uh, at least it will be the last of this series before we're, oops, we're out of the country, but this is, it, as far as we know today, the last of the series. And so um, we, have, we have gone through, and because there's so much, and I thought that six classes would be able to cover it all, it's going to be impossible. I see Sister Susan back in the back shaking her head like, no way. Uh, six classes cannot because I have to skip over World War I and World War II, which, are, which many people don't know and don't even, there is not, not much historical information unless you dig, you dig deep to see that World War I and World War II were based on Germany trying to um, acquiesce or pull Turkey onto their side so that Germany could have the same thing that Napoleon was after. But we, we just don't have time because we only have three more verses to cover. That's 43, Daniel 11, 43, Daniel 11, 40, and Daniel 11, 45. And World War I and World War II actually take place between Daniel 11, 44 and Daniel 11, 45. But there's so much in those three verses, Daniel 11, 43, 44, and 45, that we just can't get it all in. And because we're in the very uh, few moments, as you can see here, we're in the return of the Eastern question. And as I have said from the very beginning, it wasn't that the Eastern question was gone. It's just that it was not as publicized and most people were not aware of it. And so today, our final class, our final lecture will be on the return of the Eastern question. And we're going to talk about its impact right now. We're going to talk about how we've got to right now and its impact right now. So before we get started, let us uh, have a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to come in and be a part, as well as the angels to uh, occupy the empty chairs. Father in heaven, again, we come before your righteous and your most holy throne of grace. We thank you, Father, for the blessings of this day. And we thank you, Father, for your angels who exceed with power and with strength, who protected each and every one of us as we made our way here. And we ask, Lord, now that you will send the Holy Spirit, that our hearts will be massaged, and that we will hear what we need to know, especially now in these last moments of Earth's history. We see so many things happening, things that we can't even cover today that are important. But Lord, we ask that you will speak through me and that the words I say be not my own. Hide me behind the cross. Lord, this is our prayer we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the, um, the important premises of this series has been that prophecy tells us what's going to happen and history tells us what has happened. And I want everyone, I would hope that everyone would understand that when God says something, he means it. And when God gives us a promise, he sticks to his promise. He said, I am the Lord God, I change not. And if he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Even if it's delayed, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means there's a delay. If God says something's not going to happen, he means it's not going to happen. If he closes the door, no one else can open it. If he opens the door, no one can shut it. So we have to have faith in God's word. And that's what this walk is all about. It's a walk of faith. Things that we cannot see sometimes don't necessarily mean they won't happen. It just won't happen. It doesn't happen in our time. And so as I had said before, I, I really love the verse in Daniel 2 and 43, Daniel 2 and 43, because that gives us an understanding as we see so many things happening uh, with countries and nations and governments and leaders trying to come together to establish one world governments. And we have seen in Daniel 2, 43, where uh, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that as we come into the end of time and you see those feet of iron and miry clay, uh, as Brother Henry talked about on this Sabbath, about that miry clay. You know, not that pure clay, but that miry clay. When these people, these abominable people, these people who are apostate or away from God, try to come together and bring government and church or, or church and state together, God says it's not going to come. It's not going to happen. The Bible tells us in Daniel 2, 43, 
And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And so even as we come to the end of time, when it looks like these nations will be pulling themselves together to come against the, the, the people of God, God has made it clear that it will not happen. And even though it will look like they may have the upper hand on us, it may appear that they have the upper hand on us, God will not allow his people to suffer. He will not. And so as we have looked at last week and the week before last were two weeks that we focused on Napoleon and, and the French Revolution. And, and now as we look through Daniel 11, 40 and 41, we should be able to clearly understand that it was Napoleon who is the hymn of Daniel 11, 40. We should understand that because if I said go get him or tell him this, or tell him to do that. Your question has to be, who is him? Amen? Amen. You gotta ask, you gotta say, well, who is the him I'm supposed to talk to? And so when you look at Daniel 11, 40, and it says, the king of the south shall push against him, the question has to be, who is him? If you don't know who him is, you cannot put him in there and say him is this or him is that. And him typically refers to, when you see him in that sentence, it refers to something that, that happened beforehand. So that him, of course, we defined was Daniel 11, 36 to 39. That's how we get that him being pushed upon or pushed against by the king of the south, which is Egypt. And that same him being pushed at against by the Ottoman or the Turks. And what Daniel, what Daniel was showing us is a reflection in Daniel 11. He's showing us a reflection of what he told us in Daniel 2.43. And that was no matter who tries to, uh, tries to pull all these countries together, no matter how many nations come together and say we're going we're gonna to have this one world government, whether it's nations or whether it's an individual, God says it will not happen. And that was the, that was the culmination of the French Revolution. The culmination was Napoleon was trying to create a one world government. He was trying to be the emperor. Remember we showed this picture right here. Remember we showed this picture when Napoleon had crowned himself emperor in the, in, in the face of, of, of Pius VII. He also, he also crowned Josephine empress. So he was now, he had now decided that he wanted to be, he wanted to, he wanted to in spite of the Pope. He wanted to create or make himself the emperor of the Roman Empire. And no one, historically, no one in, the, in the, those days made a person a king, a queen, an emperor, etc., except for the Pope. And so what Napoleon did as a culmination of the French Revolution is he said, I'm declaring myself emperor. I don't need the Pope to declare me emperor. I'm declaring myself emperor. So now he has claimed the title of emperor, and then he wants to go beyond. Remember, Daniel 2.43 says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not cleave together. So, so Napoleon is trying, or tried, at the culmination of the French Revolution to create this one world government, or the known world government. Because we see here, when he was in prison, we see here from Bible readers, in the, uh, from Bible readings for the home circle, we read the following. It says, nearly a century ago, Napoleon, while a prisoner on St. Helena, explained that when, what? Emperor of France. But he was also declaring, because at this time, there weren't many nations left in the Roman Empire because they all had become a part of the Protestant Reformation, right? So he was claiming himself emperor, not only of France, but he was claiming himself of what was left of the Roman or, quote, Holy Roman Empire. He would not consent to Alexander, Alexander being the Tsar of Russia, to have Constantinople, foreseeing the equilibrium of Europe would be destroyed. So Napoleon was not going to let Russia have the Ottoman Empire or not have Constantinople or Turkey, but he wanted it himself. Because he says in the next line, in the history of Napoleon by Lanfrey, he says, it says, many times during the deadly delays, of this fatal siege, this was in the time of the, uh, 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 this was in 19, excuse me, 1798, when the time of the end began, many times during the daily delays of this fatal siege, him going down to Egypt, in which he experienced his first check, he was put in check 
by the king of the north, he was heard to invade against this miserable little hole, Turkey, which came against him and his destiny. Now, remember, at this time when he went down to Egypt, he had already declared himself emperor of what was left of the Roman, Holy Roman Empire. But he wanted to expand that, thus trying to counter what Daniel 2.43 says. He says here, and many times later, when, when dwelling on the vicissitudes of his past life and the different chances which had been open to him, he repeated that if St. John de Arc, remember that was in Syria, okay, had fallen, he would have changed the face of the world and been emperor of, so he would have been emperor of Europe and emperor of the East. What was he trying to do? He was trying to bring those ten toes together. But God said it wouldn't happen. God said it wouldn't happen. Amen? Amen. Didn't he say that? Amen. And we saw, we saw that when the king of the north came against him, it wasn't just the king of the north, but the king of the north came at him as a whirlwind. And remember, part of that whirlwind was the plagues, the bubonic plague. So God said, you can try all you want. You're not going to have this one world government. Sister Susan, I see you have a question back there. Um, and history in Napoleon, or you talk about the one that was in, um, the one that came from Bible Readings for the Home Circle. Bible Readings for the Home Circle, page 298. Page 298, all right? 1897 version. Now, you can find that, you can find the, you can find that if you do in the back of Bible Readings for the Home Circle, just look up Napoleon, and it'll tell you that in the, if you have the 1888 version. And so, Napoleon we just saw it, was trying to become the emperor of the east. He was already emperor of the west. And so that goes to prove to us that Daniel 2.43, God says, I'm going to make sure that none of these kingdoms, no matter how hard they try, God says it's not going to happen. They can keep trying, but God says, it's just forget it. Just forget it. So now as we continue on with Daniel 1140, I want to make sure that because we, we've tried to start on time, and I want to make sure that you can answer questions because you're not going to be able to call Brother Burns, Brother Henry, out of Jordan. You've got to be able to answer these questions yourself. And so when we look at this, King of the South, okay, and Daniel 1140, because if you understand this, as we've already explained, Daniel 1136, all the rest of it becomes rudimentary. It's just basic principle. Okay, when we look at Daniel 40, Daniel 11:40, Egypt is the king of the South. Are you sure? Yeah. Are, is everyone sure? Mm -hmm. All right. When was, when, when was that established that Egypt was the king of the South? Can anyone help me with that? Thank you. I don't need to pull a book up. Sister Connie says after Alexander died, because remember, his kingdom was divided to the what? Four winds, four generals, east, west, north, south. And then they went from east, west, north, south to north and south. And so Egypt was in the south with the Ptolemies. All right? It never changed. It never changed. And then the him in Daniel 1140 was, was who? Napoleon. Or, or the French. Napoleon was, Napoleon was as to the French as Alexander, Alexander was to the Greeks. We okay with that? We're okay with that? Amen. Okay, and then the north, the king of the north was Turkey. You need, to be, you need to be so firm on this, brothers and sisters. Because this right here has been one of, this has been, as a friend of mine, a brother in the faith, said this has been the biggest conspiracy in Seventh-day Adventism. This has been something that the Seventh-day Adventist, this was what the Seventh-day Adventist church believed and studied and conveyed to the world up until 1943. And when it changed in 1943, it was because someone came in and started changing our doctrinal information. Do I have a question? This is, we, we can exchange, we can have interchange if, if we want, no problem. And so we see here that the Eastern question, Napoleon's aim was Constantinople and what? See? It wasn't just a matter of something simple. It wasn't just a matter of he just wanted Egypt. He wanted world dominion. He said, if I succeed, this is Napoleon's words, he says, if I succeed, I shall find in the town Accra, Syria, the Pasha's treasure in arms for 300,000 men. I stir up and arm all Syria. I march on Damascus. Damascus is in Syria, as well as Aleppo. As I advance in the country, my army will increase with the discontented, the discontented of Syria, who were discontented being under the thumb of the king of the north. He says, I reach Constantinople 
with armed masses. I overthrow the Turkish Empire. I found in the East a new grand empire. That's not a Seventh-day Adventist writer. Historically, it proves that what Daniel 11, 40 through 45 said would happen, it did happen. Just the way the Lord said it would happen. We'll move on. We'll move on. A turning point in history. This is a point where history turned around. It says, Napoleon was not yet sufficiently subdued by misfortune at Accra to order a retreat. The fate of the East said he is yonder fort. In vain, other columns and even the guise of Napoleon, his last reserve advanced to the attack. They were all repulsed with dreadful loss. Meanwhile, the baggage, sick, and field artillery were silently defiling to the rear. The heavy cannon were buried in the sand, and on the 20th of May, look. Look at what it says. Napoleon, for the first time in his life, ordered a retreat. He didn't just lose against the king of the north. He lost against prophecy. He lost against prophecy because he was trying to bring together world dominion. And so, brothers and sisters, when we go on to the next verse, when we go on to the ver next verse, one of the biggest verses that your brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in Christ, get tripped up on, the question again is, what and where is the glorious land? What and where is the glorious land is my question to you. What? I hear one person tell me that it's Jerusalem. How many people feel, believe, trust that the glorious land is Jerusalem. I see one person. How many people? I see two people. I see three people. I see four or five. It's getting higher. I feel like I'm going for a bid. <laughs> How many people are not sure? Sister, one sister says she's not sure. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna clear this up. We're going to clear this up. How did Israel lose its standing as God's people? Okay, we talked about this last week. We talked about this last week. We find this in Ezekiel 5, excuse me, Ezekiel 15 and 6. Because we got to find out how the people who were in the glorious land abdicated their rights to the glorious land. It didn't mean that the land changed its position. The glorious land never stopped being the glorious land. Where did Daniel pray in Daniel 6? Where did he pray to? Towards the glorious land. Now, the land laid in what we are told in Scripture? It laid in, what said it again? Ruin. It was desolate. God allowed the Babylonians to come and in three different sieges destroy the land. But if the land was destroyed and it was no longer the glorious land, why would Daniel pray in that direction? The people did not make the land glorious. The buildings did not make the land glorious. It was God's presence and it was the promise that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what made that land glorious. And so in Ezekiel 15 and 6, the Bible tells us, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to give you to the fire. Why? And I will make the land what? Desolate. Because they have committed trespass. What is a trespass? They sinned against God. But let's go a little deeper than that. Let's go a little deeper to really find out about this glorious land. People say that America is the glorious land. I see heads shaking. No, no, no. But it's good that you can shake your head, but it's more important that you can prove that it's not. Did you guys say something like that? Okay, you need to be able to prove it. Let's look in Daniel 11, 16, as we, as we try to divine the, the differences between America being the glorious land and what the true glorious land is. We need to be able to define why the United States is not the glorious land and the principles of which you say Israel, the land, is still the glorious land. Because, see, many people will say, well, that's evangelical. You're like evangelical. The evangelicals want us to protect Israel for the people. No. That's what they believe, but that's not, they're, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. See, they're doing it for the people. God says the land is glorious, not the people. See, first, we are justified by our belief in Christ. Then our life is a life of what? Sanctification. And if we live that life out, that life of sanctification out, we receive what? Glorification. So how do the people make the land glorious? How can, a, how can an inglorious people make a land glorious? But anyway, is America the glorious land? Look with me, if you will, to Daniel 11 and 16. Daniel 11 and 16. 
The Bible's going to tell us what the glorious land is. Now, since we've been in Daniel, when we look in Daniel 11, 16, what we can see is a definition of the, the glorious land for, the, for, for, for our study. Daniel eleven sixteen says, but he that cometh against him shall do. Now, remember Daniel eleven sixteen is introducing, I want to know, what empire does Daniel eleven sixteen introduce? I'll give you a hint. Daniel eleven three introduced Greece. So who's the next empire? Rome. Rome. Okay, so Daniel eleven sixteen introduces Rome. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. So that's Rome doing according to his own will. And none shall stand before him, and he shall do what? Stand in the glorious land. When Rome took over when, in 168 BC, did not Rome at least go in to Israel? So this thing right here tells us that Rome did stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. But then we have to look and see and get a clearer understanding of this glorious land and see if the glorious land is or is not still Israel. We look here in Daniel 11.41. Daniel 11.41 says, he shall enter into the glorious land. This is where people get tripped up. This is where our people get tripped up because they say, after the Berlin Wall fell, they say after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 that the Roman Catholic Church entered into the United States. Have you not heard that? I know, I've read it. That's what I've read. That's how we get this idea that the papacy is the king of the north because the papacy came into the United States and the next after it goes into the land, then it goes from the land to the church. And they say the United States is the glorious land. And we're gonna I'm going to show you how this happened though. I'm going to show you how this happened. He shall enter also into the glorious land and put that in parentheses that many people believed and some believe now that the United States is the glorious land. And the reason why they believe the United States is the glorious land is because the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in the United States. But the contention has to be if there are 18 million Seventh-day Adventists and only 1 million in the United States, then what about the other ones? <laughs> he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now remember last week, we showed the map, right? And we showed Ammon, Moab and Edom, and we showed that this way here showed the, 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 it showed the route that the Turks went to go after Napoleon, and it showed that Ammon, Moab, and Edom, all of those lands were not in the route, and they had never been under the control of the Ottoman Empire. But many say, well, they spiritualize and tell you that Edom is a group of people who don't believe, and et cetera, et cetera, but we're not going to go on that route. We're go what we're going to do is we're going to find out through scripture, how the glorious land falls in to modern day, modern day, modern day um, interpretation. And so when we look at Daniel 8 and 9, Daniel 8 and 9, here we see again uh, the use of the term glorious land or the parallel word for glorious land. Daniel 8 and 9 says it this way. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which now this right here is the time of Grecia or the time of the, the, the Grecian Empire. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed great, excuse me, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And so the glorious land and the pleasant land are both defined as the land where the people of God live. But it's not the people who made the land glorious. It's the promise as we're gonna find out very, very shortly. And so when we look at Daniel 8 and 9, Israel being the glorious land is the, is the original and only glorious land. Did God ever designate another country or land as glorious? Does any, can anyone show me where God has designated another land as glorious? And the reason why everybody is shaking their head is because God never did designate another land as glorious. It's the same land that God told Moses what? When Moses was, had run out of Egypt after he had killed, he had killed the God, and when Moses was going to walk on that land, what did God say to Moses out of the bush? Take off your shoes. For you are on what? Holy, Holy land. Holy ground. That land was in Mount Horeb. And Mount Horeb are the collection of mountains where God, when, he, when his presence was in Israel, that's where it is. And so that is the glorious land. 
However, those that believe America is the glorious land use the following scriptures to support their theory that America is the glorious land. Let's look at those theories. Turn with me to Revelation 12 and 6. Revelation 12 and 6. This is going to be your biggest encumbrance to getting your brethren and sisters to understand that Israel is going to be attacked in Daniel 11.45. Revelation 12 and 6 says this. This is what our brethren say substantiates the United States is the glorious land. They say, and the woman, this is what the scripture says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Many people will say that the United States is that land. It was a land that God prepared or made so that the, so that the church, the Protestant church, could grow there. Does that make sense based on what you see in that statement? No. I heard one no. I heard just one no. Does it make sense or do you want me to explain why it doesn't make sense? Explain. Good enough. There's your answer right there. The last one, two, three. The last section where it says that they, this, this land, the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. That was okay for far, Correct. How long is this place prepared of God? 1260 years, right? When does 1260 years begin? Where was the United States in 538? Not in existence. So if the United States is the glorious land, and this is the scripture that they use to substantiate it, you'd have, they'd have to explain to you what, where, would, where was this church from 538 to 1776. See, that's one of the reasons why this idea that the United States is the glorious land, it doesn't hold water. Because the United States doesn't come onto the scene until towards the very end of the 1260 years. Amen? Okay, let's read the next verse that, that they use. Daniel 12 and 14. See, when, when you put together these kind of studies and you start sharing it with people, they start asking questions to challenge your position. And you may not be able to answer it right off the bat. But then you're forced to go back and study so that you can answer the question, not just for them, but for others who are going to have the same question. And that's how we were able to come and, and find out it doesn't hold water. And so when we look at Daniel 12 and 14, it says, in the woman, the church. I'm sorry, Revelation 12, 14. I apologize. Thank you. Revelation 12 and 14. <laughs> Brother Jordan was ready to come and grab me. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> and you're right. It, is, it only has 13. Revelation 12 and 14 says the following. And the woman, the church, was given two wings of a great eagle. <coughs> Excuse me. That she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time. Again, it shoots that in the foot because the United States was not in existence in 538. As a matter of fact, if you think about the old <coughs> rhyme which says uh, Columbus should sail the ocean blue in 1492. So we still got to wait about 900 years for the United States to come on the scene. And then finally in verse 16 of the same chapter, Revelation, verse, uh, Revelation 12 and 16, and the earth helped the woman. It doesn't say a specific part of the earth. It says the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now, from the time of the Dark Ages or really early on after the Dark Ages, the church was helped, especially as we come into the time of the Reformation. But there were places before the United States came on the scene that helped the church. Were there not? How about... Israel of the Alps, where the Waldenses were. How about in southern France, where the Albigenses were? How about France, where the Huguenots were? How about Germany? So the earth was not one specific location. The earth was many places where the people of God were protected, whether it was because they were hidden in caves, whether it was in, in the basement of people's homes, or whether the government itself said it did not like what Rome was doing. It may have been a Catholic government, but they were allowing the people to do what they had to do. And that was to study the word of God. So the glorious land cannot be a land that came on the scene in 1776. 
it would not it would not hold true because the, the prophecy says that the the the, the land helped the woman for um, for a thousand two hundred and three score days. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to knock your socks off here. This is going to be kind of hard, but the truth is the truth. A friend of ours says, and you guys have seen him on on video, says the truth is the truth. Y'all know what that is, right? Well, brothers and sisters, the truth is the truth. The question is, who initiated this idea that any land other than Palestine is a glorious land? Who did this? No, I wish it was. I really wish it was because I don't... This could be, this could be tough for some of us. It's going to be tough for some of us. The Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be tough. This statement says, Palestine has had the curse of God ruling up on it ever since the death of the Son of God. We know that. When they killed Jesus, they did fall under the curse. That's why God, that's why in 70 AD, in 70 AD the, the, the sanctuary, the tabernacle was destroyed. But that was the building. It wasn't the land. Whatever it may have been, he, this person is speaking of Palestine, whatever it may have been, it is not now, at the time of the prophecy, speaks to, to me, any, any such country. He's saying in Daniel 11.45, this individual was saying in Daniel 11.45, Palestine can't fit. If there is any portion of our world that God has forsaken more than another, it is that which drank up the blood of the prophets, the Son of God, and his holy apostles. But is, is it the land that did it, or was it the people who did it? This individual is saying that the land is under a curse. If that was the case, then Daniel, when, when, the, land was in the, when the land lay desolate, Daniel would not have prayed in that direction. This individual says the following. But the Western continent, meaning the United States, is now at the time, this is November 29th, 1877. But the Western continent is now at the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy, just such a land. So he's saying that the land that you, the, the, where Palestine used to have the, 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 the goodness of God reigning upon it, now that goodness has been shared over to the United States. Here, he says, stretching between the Atlantic and the Pacific, what, what land stretches between Atlantic and Pacific? Okay. Is a country which is the desire of all nations. We know that's true, isn't it? Wasn't it? Hasn't it been? Even the poor uh, Ch Chinaman with all his idolatry and the fil and filth flocks and filth flocks to our comparatively delightly, delightful land by thousands. And then he says the following. Our free schools, the freedom of the press, and freedom of the religious liberty added to the fertility of our vast country make it at this time the land of delight. We close this article with the inquiry, viewing the past and the present, is there not more pr probability that the, that the seat of the beast will be moved to our country than that the seat of the, of the Turkish government will be moved to Palestine. So he said, the seat of the beast is going to come to the United States, not to Palestine. Whose initials do you see there? Whose initials do you see here? Can anybody see this initial, Brother Mike? James White. James White. James White. That was um, November 29, 1877. This was James White. He was the only pioneer that took that position. And that's why there is a division within the church. Because he was the, I hate to tell you, but I'm telling you the truth, he was the prophet's husband. And many people even today feel that he's almost as credible as the prophet's husband, as the prophet him, herself. Because she was a woman. I'm just telling you the truth. You see it. You can go online. You can go and get this yourself. See if Brother Burns is making this up. This is where this idea was initiated in 1877. Let's continue. Let's continue. I know this. It, it was a blow to me, and I typically hold these things back. But I couldn't. And so the question still is, is America the glorious land? Based on what he just said, is America the glorious land? Let's see what the pioneers said about this. 
The right to hold human beings in bondage and to buy and sell them is now made out in the most confident manner from the Old and New Testament by the leading doctors of divinity of most denominations. They, the most denominations back in 1855 by the doctors of divinity were saying it's your right to hold slaves. Protestant, de Protestant, de Protestant denomination leaders were saying it's the right to hold slaves. Watch, see what J. and Andrew continues to say. And some of the most distinguished and skillful are able to make out this from the golden rule. The professed church, to the fearful extent, is the right arm of the slave power. The professed church, the right arm of the slave power, the glorious land, mercy. And our own nation is a perfect illustration on the subject of slavery. Of a nation drunken with the wine of Babylon. That most infamous law, the Fugitive Slave Bill. Anyone know what the Fugitive Slave Bill was? What was the Fugitive ba Slave Bill? It was a bill that said, if a slave escaped from the south and went to the north, the part where, where, there was, where slavery was really, it wasn't illegal, it just wasn't acceptable, that northern person who saw that slave had to return that person back to the south. That was the Fugitive Slave Act, and if you did that, you were actually held in contempt as well. He says that most infamous law, the Fugitive Slave Bill, was vindicated by our most distinguished, it law was vindicated by our most distinguished doctors of divinity as a righteous measure. The glorious land, the glorious land, let's continue. He continues and says, let us examine if all men are born free and equal, why then does this power, the United States, hold three millions of human beings in bondage to slavery? Why is it that the Negro race is reduced to the rank of chattel personnel and bought and sold like brute beasts? If the right of private judgment be allowed by the Protestant church, why does she expel men from her communion for no greater crime than that of attempting to obey God in something wherein his word may not be in accordance with her creed? They'll kick you out of the church back then. The glorious land? Read Charles Beach's work. The Bible is a sufficient creed. Why are men for no other crime than looking for Jesus Christ expelled from the churches of those who profess to love his appearing? The glorious land? The glorious land? Finally, he says this, to nail it, in case you're not clear. The Protestant church in 1892, till within a short time, held many thousand slaves. Not the United States now. He's, he's narrowed it down to Protestant churches. He says the Protestant church, till within a short time, held many thousand slaves. Nor is the fact to be disguised that the professed church was the right arm of the slave power. Nor was slavery abolished by the churches. To the secular power falls the honor of overthrowing this gigantic evil. And the churches have never confessed their great wrong in so long upholding this iniquitous system. This great fact identifies the Protestant church as a part of Babylon with absolute certainty. The glorious land and those churches in the glorious land? Oh, mercy. The celebrated Albert Barnes, whose notes on the New Testament are so widely diffused, uses the following startling language. He says, there is no power out of the church that could sustain slavery an hour if it were not sustained in it or in the church. So the only reason the United States was able to sustain slavery was because the churches did not speak against slavery. The churches are the bulwark of American slavery. It's no way in the world, brothers and sisters, that if anyone says that the United States is the glorious land, they can't make it fit. They cannot make it fit. The United States, is in, it's impossible to say it is the glorious land. It's impossible. But guess what, brothers and sisters? They don't stop at the United States because remember, remember, people say the United States is a glorious land, but what do they say is the glorious holy mountain? What do they say is the glorious holy mountain? What did you say, Brother Mike, Sister Burns? God's church. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Does God have a church that separates or divides itself in terms of Does God have a church that divides itself in terms of black and white? Then why are there black and white conferences? 
But this is God's glorious holy mountain is what they tell you. Does it make sense? It makes no sense. It's nowhere in the world you're going to tell me that this is God's glorious holy mountain. Because if you even try to say that, then you have to look at the fact that since 1844, where has Jesus been standing? Outside He's been on the outside. He's been knocking on the outside trying to come into the church. So how does, the, how does this glorious holy mountain become the United States, or excuse me, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when since 1844, Jesus has been on the outside knocking to come in, knocking to come in. And believe you me, brothers and sisters, when, when, the, when Israel was called the glorious lamb, Jesus was walking through the streets and he preached in the streets and in the synagogues and the glorious land. Did he not? He's on the outside of this church. And there's no way in the world you're going to convince anyone that he's inside the United States. Not with the things that have happened. The prophet says the following. She says, ask yourself if Christ would make any difference in assembling his people. Would he say, here brother or here sister, your nationality is not Jewish. You are of a different class. Would he say, those who are dark skinned may fall into the back seats. Those of a lighter skin may come up the front seat. Hmm. See, so when the brethren tell you that the United States is a glorious land or the church is God's glorious holy mountain, brothers and sisters, you got enough proof. You got more than enough proof. Finally, during the, during the Civil War, when the North was ready, you'll find this in Testimonies to the Churches, Volume 1. When the North was ready to give in to the South and say, we'll just let you back in and you just can go ahead and keep your slavery. God said, no, you're not going to do that. J. N. Loftus says the following in the great Second Advent mo movement. He says, in a speech by ex-governor John Paul St. John of Kansas in Ottawa, Illinois, to which I, John Loftus, listened on the afternoon of June 29, 1891, he made the following statement. The government, governor made the following statement. I was never so disappointed as I was when the Confederates whipped us, the Union, at Bull Run. But it was all a part of God's plan. Had we, the North, whipped the Confederates, the South, the politicians would have hatched up a peace. And the Union would have been continued with slavery and we would have had it today. They were ready to compromise. For two years, the Confederates had the advantage. God let them beat up on the, on the North. But after Lincoln issued the famous Emancipation Proclamation, this is the governor saying this, after Lincoln issued the famous Emancipation Proclamation, we had swung around to God's side and could not lose. You see, brothers and sisters, when people start saying things and they can't substantiate it, they'll find all kinds of ways to make it work. But history is not on their side. And that's why we understand Daniel 11 to be a literal. If you spiritualize and try to say the Seventh-day Adventist church is God's glorious, holy, God's glorious holy mountain and God is trying his best to get in and God sees disunity, if God sees a black and white conference, God says, that's not how I have my church. It doesn't make sense. And so I wanted to make sure that I addressed that immediately because I had so much to cover and I got still a little time, a little time to cover the other. And so as we go on, so are, we, are we convinced, before I move on a little further, uh, I think when I get back, I think when I get back, I'm going to um, add some more to this. I'm going to give you some more. I'm not going to add some more to it. I'm going to give you some more. So that was to clarify Daniel 1141. Are we clear on Daniel 1141? Are we clear on the glorious land? Are we clear why the United States is not the glorious land? Because I'm going to have to, you're going to have to understand why. Israel is, I mean, why, why the Seventh-day Adventist church is not God's glorious holy mountain, because that is going to be for you in the, um, as we move towards the end of time. Daniel 11, 42. Daniel 11, 42. It says, we, 41, we covered 41 just now, so let's look at Daniel 11, 42. He shall stretch forth his hand, also, pull on, also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He here is the same he that ran France out of Egypt. Okay? So he would be whom? Who? Ottomans. It's the Ottomans, right? 
He ran, remember, he ran France out of Syria. He ran it out, 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 of, um, out of Syria into Israel and then out to Egypt. And then they ran, ran him out of the country. And so when, when the Ottomans chased and ran Napoleon out, they, recap, they recaptured Egypt. And by recapturing Egypt, it says right here, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Does that need to be explained any further? That's pretty simple, right? Let's go on to verse 43. Because we got just two more. We got a lot of time to cover these two. This is going to be wonderful. Daniel 11.43 says, he shall, this is still under the power, under the, this is part of 11.42, but it's, 40, it's, it's designated as 43, but it has the same application to Egypt. And so the Bible says in Daniel 11.43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and of, over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Remember, Napoleon was going down to Egypt to try to raid the, 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 the pyramids. Remember? And so now that Napoleon was out of the way, the Turks could go and they could, they could grab whatever they had to grab. So that just stands to reason that historically it makes all the sense in the world. But Uriah Smith puts it this way. He says, history gives the following facts. When the French were driven out of Egypt and the Turks took possession, the Sultan permitted the Egyptians to reorganize their government as it was before the French invasion. He asked of the Egyptians neither soldiers, guns, nor fortifications, but left them to manage their own affairs independently with the important exception of putting the nation under the tribute to himself. What is another word for tribute? Taxes. So in other words, the Turks said everything is the way it used to and you need to still keep sending us the money. Okay? Tribute, where we are. Um, da, 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 da. In the articles of agreement between the Sultan and the Pasha, the Sultan being the, 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 um, the Turks, the Pasha being the Egyptians of Egypt, it was stipulated that the Egyptians should pay annually to the Turkish government a certain amount of gold and silver and 600,000 measures of corn and 400,000 of barley. Is that what the scripture said would happen? Is that what the scripture said would happen? Historically, it says it happened. So there we have it. What page? What page? I'm sorry. It's uh, your, um, page 309. 309. Are we okay with that? Are we okay? Because, brothers and sisters, these last two verses are the most phenomenal you're going to ever see. Okay, I see head shaking. That we're okay. I can keep moving. I want to be sure. <laughs> Daniel 11:44. But tidings out of the east. This is so important. I used, to, I used to believe what everyone else believed on this. And then when I understood, when I started reading the history of it, I said, wow, I was bamboozled. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to, te to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to us. And I read two of them. I only wanted to read one. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Common, the common belief is this is the three angels messages. The common belief that 1144 is the giving of the three angels' messages will cause or trouble the, trouble the papacy. And as a result of the papacy being troubled, he will, he will start or he will make a, a, a national Sunday law. Has anyone ever heard that before? I know I used to teach that. Okay, that was what it was. But let's be realistic about it. Let's just look at what's the day? Wednesday the 8th, right? What happened last Tuesday? Not yesterday, but last Tuesday. Come on, y'all know what happened last Tuesday? Right, they said the Reformation is over, right? right? Now, did they do that because of something we've been saying? No. Did we cause them to want to do away with anyone who keeps the Sabbath? No, they did it despite us. We're not even giving the three angels messages. That's why Brother Henry has been working so hard to teach us the three angels message so somebody can be giving the three angels messages. But this scripture says the giving of the three angels messages shall trouble the papacy. If it troubles the papacy, if the giving of the three angels messages troubles the papacy, he has to come from out of the wilderness and come after us. He doesn't come out of the wilderness until it's time for the universal death decree. Right? 
If he comes out any time before the universal death decree, then we as Seventh-day Adventists can say, we told you that's who it was. See, so these tidings can't be the three angels' messages. I'm going to show you what it is. These tidings have to be something else. The pioneers believed that these tidings were a warning that had an effect on him. And the him in this series of scripture are Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Who is the him that's left? Because Egypt, I mean, because France has been pushed out. There's only one him left now. And that's, no, it's not. I didn't, maybe I heard something wrong. Who is that him? Who is the him? Let's go back to Daniel 11, 42. Napoleon. What did you say? Napoleon. Not Napoleon. Remember, Napoleon has been run out already. Napoleon was run out in Daniel 11, 40 and 41. Okay. Turkish Empire. The Turkish Empire. Because they're the only... The, 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 remember, the king of the south, the Egyptians, are now under the control of the Turkish Empire. So if they're not on the scene. France has been cast out. So Napoleon went back. So there's only one power left. It may not be a quote-unquote world power. But it's still a power that's left. Sister Susan, your question. Uh huh. Uh huh. Exactly. Well, we we came in believing something differently, but we studied this for six, seven years. We studied this hardcore. I mean, Lyme, we were, reading, we were reading everything, and someone called and asked us, and I said, I'm not confident enough. I, this, is what I, this is what we have studied. And he said, that's right. He didn't know. He said, that fits perfectly. He said, why aren't you teaching this? And I said, well, he said, well, you're supposed to. That was last year, but let's keep going. So let's figure out these tidings out of the east and tidings out of the north. Out of the east, it has to be something. If this is a literal, and Daniel 11 is literal, it has to be a geographical east of the Ottomans or of Constantinople. It has to also be something that says north or north of Constantinople. There are two countries that we would have to look for that come into conflict with Turkey and sometime before Daniel 1145 that causes Turkey to be furious. Let's see. Let's see what Bishop Thomas Newton says on this. Did I have a question? Question? Okay. Bishop Thomas Newton on the prophecy says the following. Yes. Say it again. Russia. It is universally known that the Persians are seated to the east of the Othman dominions and the Russians to the north. <laughs> Persia hath indeed of late years been miserably torn and distractedly inter inter intestinal in divisions, in internal divisions, but when it shall unite again in a settled government under one sovereign, it may become again, as it hath frequently been, a dangerous rival and enemy to the Ottoman Empire. So we see, this guy was a Bible scholar. He, I mean, he's very solid. And he, he, a lot of the things that he quotes, or a lot of the prophecies that he interprets, were things that our pioneers read after him. He, he passed away long before them. He continues and says, the power of Russia is growing daily. It is a contradiction among common people in Turkey that the empire shall one time or other be destroyed by the Russians. So right there you see two entities, one being east and one being to the north of the Ottoman Empire. And then A.T. Jones says the following. He says, there is yet one other element to be noticed in this connection. And that is that the Turks themselves expect this very thing also. The Turks themselves expect to be removed from Constantinople. They expect that the seat of their power to be in Jerusalem. They expect then that the nations will come even there to war against them. And that then the end of all things will come. So the Turks already know that somebody's coming after them. He continues, that's out of present truth, United Kingdom, Sister, Sister Susan. I know you're going to ask me. A.T. Jones, present truth, United Kingdom. Hmm. I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to skip this one only because of time, and we can, we can, we can, we'll be okay without it. 
eight, um, Uriah Smith says the following. Speaking of 1140, 1144, I want you to grab this. This is so perfect. He says, on this verse, Dr. Clark, Adam Clark, has a note which is worthy of mention. He says this part of the prophecy, that Adam Clark wrote this in 1825. He says this part, in other words, everything had happened until 1143, but 1144, Adam Clark was, was writing, it had not happened. His, this part of the prophecy is allowed to be yet fulfilled. Unfulfilled. Yet unfulfilled, thank you. His note was printed in 1825. In another portion of his comments, he says, if the Turkish power be understood, as in the preceding verses, 1140 to 1143, it may mean that the Persians on the east and the Russians on the north will at some time greatly embarrass the Ottoman government. Daniel in the Revelation, page 309. Between this conjecture of, of, of Dr. Clark's written in 1825 and the Crimean War in 1853. So he wrote it in 1825 saying, this might be what's going to happen. But Uriah Smith, Clark was passed off the scene at the time. But Uriah Smith is saying, and the Crimean War of 1853, 1856, there is certainly a striking coincidence in so much as the very powers he mentions, the Persians on the east and the Russians on the north were the ones which instigated the conflict, the Crimean War. Tidings from these powers troubled him Turkey. Their attitude and movements incited the Sultan to anger and revenge. Russia, being the more aggressive party, was the object of attack. Turkey declared war on her powerful northern neighbor. Remember now, 1840, what happened to Turkey? 1840, August 11th, 1840, what happened to Turkey? Come on. They lost their independence. They had to succumb to the Christian nations of, of Western Europe. So Turkey now was poor, and they didn't have much power. August 11th, 1840. Now here we are, 13 to 16 years later, in Russia, thinking that Turkey is now weakened. Look at what they do. They attack Turkey. Russia and Persia attack Turkey. Their attitude and movements incited the Sultan to anger and revenge. Russia, being the more aggressive party, was the object of the attack. Turkey declared war on her powerful northern neighbor in 1853. How dare Turkey? It didn't have any power. The world looked on in amazement to see a government which had long been called the sick man of the East. A government whose army was dis dispirited and demoralized, whose treasuries were empty, whose rulers were vile and imbecile, and whose subjects were rebellious and the threatening succession rushed with such impetuos impetuosity into the conflict. Turkey went to attack Russia. The Bible said it would happen. He continues and says, the prophecy said that they should go forth with great fury. And when they thus went forth, in the war aforesaid or pre mentioned, they were described in the profane vernacular of an American writer as fighting like devils. Yeah. That's how the Turks were fighting against the Persians and the Russians, and they won. England and France, it is true, soon came to help with the help of Turkey, but she went forth in the manner described and as is reported, gained important victories before receiving the assistance of these powers. God tells us these things, brothers and sisters. Daniel 11.45 happened from, from 1853 to 1856. 1853 to 1856. Daniel 11.44, what did I say? 45. Daniel 11.4, Sister Connie and Sister Burns corrected me. Daniel 11.44 happened from, with the Crimean War. The tidings out of the east, Brother Henry, I'm going to get you in just a second. Oh, the tidings out of the east were the Persians east of the Ottoman Empire, and the tidings out of the north were the Russians. And him was Turkey, and he went forth and battled against the Persians, and the, he should have lost miserably. He should have lost. By the time the French and the English came in, they had already won some battles. God said prophecy was going to be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled. Remember, this is Ishmael. That's right, Sister Connie. This is Ishmael. God said he's going to be here. 
until the until the Euphrates is dried up. Amen. I see a, I see your hand back here, Sister Sister Brenda. Come on, speak up. They lost it in 1840. Remember Josiah Lynch and William Miller made a prophecy in, in, in um, 1838 that said, and it, it refers to Revelation 9, 13 through 15. And remember it talks about the four angels, loose the four angels for, for, a day, for a day, an hour, a year, and a month, 391 years and 15 days. And so from that time, July 27th, uh, 1499 until August 11th, 1840, the Ottomans were allowed to attack the west, the eastern frontier of the of the European of, of, of Western Europe, and it came to its end, 391 days, 391 years, and 15 days. Josiah Lynch and William Miller interpreted the prophecy and published it in, in 1838, saying that in two years the Ottomans will lose their independence. That was what gave the Seventh-day Adventist Church the impetus, or the, that's what made people say these people know what they're talking about. And that's the reason why when we look at Daniel 10, 4 and 5, when it's told, we're told time shall be no more, time shall be no more, but events, prophecies will still be. And this is the event that we need to be able to use to show people that we can see what's happening based on Scripture. Daniel 1145, and I'll show you in a moment, I don't want to get too much ahead of myself. Daniel 1145 will, will, will hone it all in. We'll hone it all in. Okay? Finally, we see here that the, this, is, this is Wikipedia, if I'm not mistaken. This is Wikipedia. Yeah, this is Wikipedia. The Crimean War was a military conflict fought from October 1853 to February 1856, in which the Russian Empire lost, lost to an alliance of the Ottoman Empire. France, Britain, and Sardinia. They should, Russia should not have lost. Turkey really shouldn't have been able to hold them off for any period of time. The immediate cause involved the rights of Christian minorities in the Holy Land, which was a part of the Ottoman Empire. The French promoted the rights of Roman Catholics, while Russia promoted those of Eastern Orthodox Church. The longer term cause involved the decline of the Ottoman Empire, they further went down, and the unwillingness of Britain and France to allow Russia to gain territory and power at Ottoman's expense. It, was widely, it, has, it has widely been noted that the causes in one case involving an argument over a key have never revealed a great confusion of purpose, yet led to a war noted for its not notoriously incompetent international butchery. Ru Russia said they were coming to the rescue Russia said they were coming to the rescue of the Protestants in Crimea. Russia? Russia? Russia has been an atheistic country. Are you going to say something, Brother Mike? Okay. So when we look at the Crimean conflict, we look at the Crimean conflict, that is where we, are, we have been since how long? How long have we been standing on Daniel 11:44, brothers and sisters? That's a question. Since how long, Sister, Sister um, Connie? 1856. We have been at a standstill, brothers and sisters, in the book of Daniel since, da since 1856 and the Crimean War. Now let's look back, which what started this whole lecture series. Let's look at what started this whole lecture series. Let's go to Matthew 25, 1 and 13. This is the... This is the, the this is the um, the wise and the foolish virgins. The, this is the wise and foolish virgins of Daniel. Um, excuse me, of Matthew 25, 1 through 13. The Bible tells us, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom did what? While the bridegroom did what? Tarry. What does it mean to tarry? Delay. Delay. While, he, while, while the bridegroom, while the bridegroom tarried or delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet them, him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. 
lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The prophet says this about this. This is in Christ's Object Lessons, 400 and page 405. It's extremely important that you read that chapter and you digest that chapter. She says, speaking of this incident, lingering near the bride's house are 10 young women robed in white. Each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon for oil. All are anxiously waiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. But there is a delay. delay. Hour after hour passes. The watchers become weary and fall asleep. We've been, this, this is where we've been since 1850, 1856. At midnight, finally, the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. How have we been using the time since we came into this message? There's no one here that's been here since 1853. The question is, what have you been, it's not what have you been doing since 1853. The question is, what have you been doing with this message? How have you been using the oil that God has allowed the Holy Spirit to give to you? Because this delay time is going to determine how you and I are using this oil that God has given to us. He is giving us this delay not because of him, it's because of us. The sleepers suddenly, no, at midnight, the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The sleepers, the church, suddenly awakens, awaken, spring to their feet. They see the procession moving on, bright with torches and glad with music. They hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Then the ten maidens seize their lamps and begin to trim them and haste to go forth. But five have neglected to fill their flasks with the Holy Spirit. They have not been learning at the feet of Jesus. They've been learning at the feet of men. This time of delay, God wanted to see who you would trust. Who would you, who would you listen to? Would you have the faith of Abraham and trust God no matter what? Would you not believe the evidences of your senses or would you listen to what another man tells you? This delay is for us to show God that we are going to lean upon him and upon him only. The prophet continues and says this. They did not anticipate what? So long a delay. 1856 to now is a long delay, brothers and sisters, isn't it? We did not anticipate this, did we? And they have not prepared for the emergency. In distress, they appeal to their wiser companions saying, give, up, give us of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the waiting five with their freshly trimmed lamps have emptied their flagons. They have no oil to spare, and they answer, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to, sell, to, to them that sell and buy for yourselves. The prophet continues. That's in Christ's Object Lesson, page 405. The whole section is, go ye out to meet him, the bridegroom cometh. She says in letter 184, she says, we may have to, this was after 1856. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years as did the children of Israel but for Christ's sake his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action she continues back in Christ's object lesson she says what while they went to buy the procession moved on and left them behind the five with lighted lamps joined the throng and entered the house with the bridal train and the door was shut when the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall, they, re they received an unexpected denial. The master of the, of the feast declared, I know you not. They were left standing without in the empty street in the blackness of the night. Brothers and sisters, we're in the time now. I want to show you a couple of things before I move on. Uh, just bear with me just a second. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off a second. Let's go ahead. So you see we're in a delay period. And you see and you hear very few people talking on this topic right here. Many people say, I don't think that Turkey fits the... People say that Turkey doesn't fit because Turkey is a sick man. Because Turkey is a sick man of the East. 
Do you know, brothers and sisters, that Turkey has the second largest military in NATO? Second largest military in NATO. You know what NATO is? North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The number one military in NATO is the United States. Turkey is number two. Not Germany, not Great Britain, but Turkey. But Turkey has the number two military. Turkey is part of the G20. Russia is not part of the NATO. And Turkey shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a part of it either. But look at how Turkey got this name, sick man. It was given to Turkey by Tsar Nicholas, and Tsar Nicholas would be a what? He's a Russian, right? And he was talking to Lord Hamilton Seymour of Great Britain, and he, he coined this phrase, and this is how we got this term, sick man of the East, which Sister White never uses. It's not in scripture either. In 1853, the Tsar Nicholas, addressing Sir Hamilton, said, we have on our hands a sick man, a very sick man. It will be a great misfortune if one of these days he should slip away from us before the necessary arrangements have been made. From that moment this conversation was divulged, Turkey became known by the epithet of the sick man. So who gave Turkey the name sick man? Why do you think Russia gave Turkey the name sick man? Students who have been here from the beginning, remember Peter the Great? And what did Peter the Great tell all the czars to do? He said, get Turkey. And so to throw the other nations off, Tsar Nicholas, the same year, the same year of the Crimean War, he says to Sir Hamilton of Great Britain, what we have on our hands is a sick man. A very sick man. And at the same time, what was he doing? Trying to take it. If it was so sick, why you want to take it? You understand? Yes, they did beat them. Yes, but, but guess what, brothers and sisters? Even though Turkey beat them, people still say today that Turkey is a sick man. Turkey cannot do what we were told it was going to do. And that is in Daniel eleven forty five, and we're still not there yet. I want to show you a couple of articles to show you how serious this thing is. This is just last year. Man, I just wish that I could make this bigger, but I can't. This is, out of, this is out of the Associated Press. This was February 11th of 2017, this year. This is this year, okay? February 11th, 2000, 2017. Turkey refer referendum on constitutional reform set for April 16th of this year. Turkey, at this particular time, was setting up to reorganize as a country and elect their president and give him total power, thus making him literally a dictator. He has power over the parliament, and the, he has power over the judges, he has power over everything. Erdogan has complete power, and he received this power on April 16th, 2017. How about this? This is NPR, National Public Radio. Historic referendum, this is April 16th, 2017. Historic referendum in Turkey grants what? I don't hear you. More power to the president. Turkey's Prime Minister Ben Ali Jindrim declared victory in the referendum bid to convert Turkey from a parliamentary to a strong president system of government. The historic referendum, which passes by a narrow margin, grants more power to President Recep Erdogan, who promised when he was elected in 2014 to be a different kind of president. But even as Erdogan's supporters set off fireworks to celebrate their victory, Turkey's main opposition party said they will challenge many of the votes. It didn't make a difference. He's still president. Erdogan said he hopes the referendum results would benefit Turkey and that the nation made a historic decision in an address after Yidrim's declaration. The date on that, April 16th. So when we, what, we, what I showed a few minutes ago, it came to be, and they gave him the unlimited power. Now, this guy in the middle, he is Mohammed II. He's a caliph, and he also was a sultan. This headdress is, is like a, you know what the pope wears on his head? A mitre. A mitre. This is the same thing. It's just this, they call it a, um, um, what do they call it? 
a turban. It's a turban. And so all these are caliphs. All these are caliphs, and these all, all, all of these men are, um, are sultans. But the main one was Muhammad II, because remember, Muhammad I was the one who started Islam. This was the one who did a lot of damage. And that right there is his crown. And the sultan, when the sultan wears this, he is actually the political and religious leader of the Muslim faith. Did you hear what I said? When, the, when, this, when, when someone wears this, he is not only, the, not only the political, but also the religious leader of the Muslim faith. Do you see something like that anywhere else? Any other religion that combines church and state together? I bring your attention to this. That's Erdogan, the president. President of Turkey. What is that right there? Can y'all see that? That's a turban. That's a turban. Erdogan just, he j they just took it out of a vault. It's a couple of hundred years old. Now he has possession of this. This was right after the election. Let's see what it says. This was August 18th, 2017. Shubat. Absolutely amazing. They don't, they don't know what we know. Okay, don't, don't, <laughs> don't allow what you see to think, that, oh, they understand, we understand. They don't understand. They don't know what we know. But they do have some things correct. It says, absolutely amazing prophecy fulfilling Erdogan of Turkey. Absolutely amazing prophecy fulfilling. Erdogan of Turkey brings back the Ottoman scepter that signifies the tenth horn prophesied in the book of the apocalypse. They, they got it confused. They got that part confused. Erdogan is mimicking a messiah. To Erdogan, the Muslim messiah, he is whom this scepter rightfully belongs. Erdogan says, I am the messiah. Oh man, I got so much more to cover. I'm going to continue with this. The Daily Sabah, Erdogan's mouthpiece in the, Arab, in the Arabic world, just published the aston astonishing event which none mentioned it in the Western media. Turkish President Recep Erdogan has unveiled the Sultan of Selim I, the Captain Diadem, the Crown, known in Turkey as the captain of the caliphate. Have y'all ever heard that word before? After returning it to its place at the Sultan Selim I shrine in Istanbul after its disappearance from 2005 when Fatullah Gulen, the guy who's in the Poconos who they're trying to get, after Gulen attempted to smuggle it to the United States of America. The captain Diadon was moved from its place in 2005 for restoration and two members of the Gulen terrorist organization tried to smuggle the captain to the organization's leader, Fatula Gulen, who in, lives in the Poconos, and the United States because of the great moral value the captain carries. In other words, the holder of the diadem is the holder of the scepter. He becomes a successor of the Ottoman Caliphate and the Muslim world as a whole. His people gave him absolute power. They gave him absolute power. Um, the story of the diadem, let me finish up real quick. The story of the Captain Diadem dates back to 1517 when Sultan Yaqwat Selim fought the Mamluks of Egypt, and king of the south, they got that part right, and managed to annex them to the territory of the Ottoman Empire and became the first successors to the Muslims of Osman family. After the attempt to smuggle the captain at Ataturk International Airport in Istanbul, it was restored and preserved for years by the Department of Museums and Archaeology and then returned to its original palace and remained hidden from view until Erdogan removed the cover yesterday during his visit to the mosque and the shrine of Sultan Selim in Istanbul. So now we're in Daniel 11.45. Now we're in Daniel 11.45. Let's turn to Daniel 11.45 so we can get, wrap this up. Mm 
when you're there, say amen. I just want to pull a couple. All right. Daniel 11.45 says the following. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Now we already know what the holy mountain is, right? So we don't have to worry about figuring out what the holy mountain is. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. He is who? Turkish. Turkish. The Turkish Empire, right? Whoever the person who's in charge of the king of the north, that's the he. And at this point, it is Turkey, correct? Are we okay with that being Turkey? Yeah. All right, let's keep going. He shall plant the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? His church. But remember, there's already a church there. There's already a church there. He just wants to have a church that's his own when he's not at the other church. But he's trying to plant his what? His palace. Now, many are going to say, but what does that have to do with us? Brothers and sisters, it's not about displacing the papacy. It's about a sign that God is trying to give you and me to see exactly what's happening in the end of time. He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. Which seas are we talking about here if this is literal Israel where he's going to? What seas? Mediterranean. Come on, you got one. Come on. Come on. Come on, what sea is that? Come on, what sea is that? No, come on. What am I doing? Dead Sea. Israel sits between <laughs> Israel sits between the Mediterranean and the, and the Dead Sea. So he plants it, the, the Black Sea is north of, the, of Turkey. So he plants his tabernacle and his palace between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now many may say, well, what point is that? Because, brothers and sisters, who are the people in Israel right now? Are they literal Jews or are they spiritual Jews? And if he does this, if the Ottoman, when, when the Ottoman Empire does this, he does this, God allows it to happen as a sign for spiritual Israel to know that things are wrapping up. Let us see if what I'm saying is not true. Turn your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy 31, 29, and I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Deuteronomy 31, uh, 31 and 29. Deuteronomy 31 and 29. You're there? 31 and 29. Now, here's Moses speaking. Now remember, Moses, we, we did this in the early part of this study. Deuteronomy is a history. It's a history that God wanted Moses to tell to the people of Israel so they would understand how God has worked with them in the past. So Deuteronomy 31, 29 says, here's Moses talking to the Jews. He says, for I know that after my death, you will do what? Utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you when? In the latter days. Who is Moses speaking to? Literal or spiritual Israel? Spiritual. No, he's not. He's speaking to his literal people, right? He's speaking to his literal people. So Moses is telling literal Israel what's going to happen to them in the latter days. He says to them, Evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. So Moses is telling literal Israel that God is going to destroy you because of what you do and because you're not going to accept the Son of God. Let's see if that's what I'm telling you is true. Look back in verse 16. Look back at verse 16, 31, 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers in this people, will rise up and go what? are whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Verse 17, then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall, do, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because of our God is not among us? Verse 18, and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, and that they are turned unto other gods. And then verse 19 says this, now, therefore, write ye the song for you and teach it, it the children of Israel, put it in their mouths that, that this song may be a, a witness for me against the people of Israel. God is telling us in the latter days, 
this is what's going to happen to Israel. Let's see. Let's get one more line of scripture to coincide this to, start, to see what God is getting ready to do in Daniel 11.45 to the physical land and the people in Israel. Turn your Bibles with me. Turn your Bibles with me to Daniel 10.14. Daniel 10.14. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Daniel 10.14. You there? Amen. The Bible says in Daniel 10.14, who is speaking to Daniel? In Daniel 10.14. Gabriel is speaking to Daniel, and Gabriel says this to Daniel, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall what? Before, Before who? Before. Who are Daniel's people at that time? Are his people literal or spiritual Israel? Literal. literal. So, God, so Gabriel is telling Daniel that this is what's going to happen to literal Israel in the latter days. He's telling Daniel this is what's going to happen to your people in the latter days. Now, let's, now let's, let's wrap this up. So this attack on the glorious, on God's glorious holy mountain will happen in literal Israel to the literal people of Israel as a warning sign to spiritual Israel so spiritual Israel will know what time it is. Daniel 12 and 1. Let's see if what I'm saying is true. As we wrap this up, let's see if this is true. Daniel 12 and 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince was standing for the children, not thy people, but the children of thy people. So are these Daniel's people or those who have inherited what Daniel's people have since turned away from? These are the spiritual Jews. The spiritual Jews are the ones who will be in the book. Let's continue. It says, the great prince, this is Michael, who would stand for the children of thy people, spiritual Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to the same time and at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Because remember, Daniel held on to the end. Daniel didn't turn away. So thy people, Daniel's people, shall be delivered. Who are Daniel's people? It says it right here. It says, everyone that shall be written in the book. So when Daniel 11.45 is having its culmination, and it's going to its end, God's people will see it and they will know that we're getting close to the end. God's people will know that this thing is about to wrap up. God's people will be saying to themselves, oh man, this is getting ready to happen. I need to get serious about my relationship and my walk with God. Let me give you these two slides so you can see just what the pioneers said. You write, um, Stephen Haskell says the following, the sealing angel goes through Jerusalem, the church, to place the seal of the living God on the foreheads of the faithful. And while this work goes forth, Turkey stands as a national guidepost to the world that men may know what is going on in the sanctuary above. He continues and says, God's eye. That's on st um, the story of Daniel the prophet, uh, page 248, paragraph 1. The story of Daniel the prophet by Stephen and Haskell. And then he says, God's eye is upon his people, and he never leaves himself without a witness in the world. No man knows when Turkey will take its departure from Europe, but when that move is made, Earth's history will be short. Then it will be said, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Today is the day of preparation, not tomorrow. It can happen any time. The fate of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome is recorded for the edification of the nations of today and lessons taught by all center in the events just before us. While the world watches Turkey, let the servant of God watch the movements of his great high priest whose ministry for sin is almost over. I have one more, one more thing I want you to see that, the, that the, the prophet says, and I'm out of here. What do you say? Yes. 7 MR, uh -huh. 7 manuscript release. Uh -huh. Was that Sister White's? Uh -huh. oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to give that to you okay. back there. I'm sorry, Sister Linda. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head. I, I want to show you one thing that Sister White says that will shake you to your, full, in your, to your core. Come on, come on. And that will be my closing line. Come on. Come on. While you're looking for that, uh -huh. is there anywhere verse 45 has something to do with Revelation 
19 and 20. Read that for me, please, sister. The last, the last verse, the last part of 45, it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that was miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. No, that doesn't, Daniel 11, 45 is, is, is two things. It is a landmark for God's people, simply that. It's to let us know, see, it is, it, is, it is a last act of mercy, it's a last act of mercy for his people. He wants his people to understand that you don't have much time. Turkey is a signpost, nothing more. It's just a signpost to tell you if Turkey is, because remember, the Euphrates comes to its complete drying up when? That's a question. When does, the, when does the Euphrates come to its complete drying up? Think of the plagues. Which plague does the Turkey come to, or the, the, the Euphrates come to its complete drying up? Which are the plagues? There are seven plagues. The sixth plague. It's the sixth plague. And so Turkey started drying up in 1840, or a little bit before. It was a big empire, and it's been shrinking, 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 shrinking. At that last point of this shrinkage, that's when it, 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 that's when it, has, it has been just completely removed from that part of the world. In other words, all the Muslims are now out of that part of the world, and now it is, the, the way is made for the kings of the East for World War Armageddon, which is a literal, not a spiritual war. And so what, what, you're, what, what, you're, ta what you're, uh, you're referring to um, has nothing to do with Daniel 11.45 because Daniel 11.45 is the last sign that God's people will have before, it's, before probation closes. That is the absolute last sign. God is saying, you don't have time. And I want to, I want to give you this. I want to give you this so you can understand how um, the prophet saw this. Come on. Okay. Look at this. Tell me if this is not true. The prophet says this. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. Amen? Okay. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumber, it was seen who had made preparations for the event. So we're between 1856 and Daniel 1145. Amen? Okay. Both parties were taken unawares but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation because they basically said we got enough time we have time the conference hasn't told us it's time so now a sudden and unlooked for calamity something that brings the soul face to face with death who is looking for turkey to attack israel who is looking for turkey to attack israel Say it again. Right. Say it again, sister. Right. Russia. Because they're going to try to motivate them. But other than Russia, if you think about what happened during the time of Josiah Lynch and William Miller, William Miller when they made the prophecy or they gave the prophecy of Daniel, I mean of Revelation 9, 13 through 15, nobody was looking for that to happen. They didn't, when, it, they didn't even, when it was the day before, they was like, yeah, right. But then when it happened, it wasn't for the Turks at the time, it was an unlooked for calamity. But it gave the movement, the motivation, and the impetus for people to start listening to them. Mm -hmm. And as you're telling people that Turkey's going to, going to move, and just like we said two weeks ago, we saw the Turkish troops on the borders of Syria, or of Syria to tell someone that Turkey was going to do that. They'd look at you like you were crazy. But guess what? It happened. Turkey is getting ready to make its move. An unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. Now, would you, if you were a Seventh-day Adventist, who should know Daniel 11.45 and know that Daniel 11.45 is the sign for you to start getting yourself together and you see it happening and you haven't been preparing, wouldn't that bring you face to face with death? Because God has been trying to tell you about it, but you've been saying, well, that's not what the other evangelists are saying. That's not what I heard. See, brothers and sisters, this is about faith. This is about how are you using this time? Are you listening and depending upon me to tell you something? No, you go and check it out for yourself. And then you determine, 
if what I'm showing you can be coincide with what history and prophecy says. Because this unlooked for calamity is going to catch a lot of people off guard. When Turkey does what it does, and I, put, and I place everything on this, like Abraham placed his faith on God's word, I place everything on this. When this happens, brothers and sisters, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say it's impossible. But it's not spiritualized. It's a literal prophecy. And God's people are given their last opportunity to see what's happening. While, while these things are going on in Turkey, God says, look up into the sanctuary where your high priest is adjudicating for you on your behalf and get your characters in line. Shouldn't this motivate you to get your character in line? And as we teach, as we, as, we, as we are showing people these things and we're giving them the first, second, and third angel's message, we will get the power. Because that was what happened the first time. The power of the prophecy. We were told, thou must do what? Prophesy again. What do you got to prophesy on? They've been hearing about a national Sunday law since when? In fact, the matter is, brothers and sisters, the National Sunday Law was adjudicated in 1892 under the Chicago World's Fair Act. Yep. So that's done. Yep. All they need to do is put more teeth in it. And God has to allow it to happen. God is looking for a people who will see what is happening in the Middle East and tell the rest of the world Turkey's going to be bold and they're going to go and take Israel. The papacy already has, you know it, don't you? The papacy already has what they say is God's glorious holy mountain. That's why your Sabbath school manuals have information and have quotes from the Jesuits. Are we waiting for that? You can't wait for that. So brothers and sisters, in closing, and I wish I had more time, but I, already, I know I'm well over. We have got to come to a conclusion. And that's why this, has been, this whole thing was based on the midnight cry. And that is, each and every one of us have to stop being foolish virgins. We have got to stop allowing the oil of someone else. Because, sooner, because if I depend upon Brother Henry's oil, one day his oil, he's going to say, Brother Burns, I love you, but all I got is enough oil for myself. And he has every right to say so. Because the Holy Spirit is what's going to reveal it to us. Let us, let us not be crying at midnight. Let us not be crying at midnight, brothers and sisters. Let each and every one of us, when that cry comes, when, that, when we hear that the bridegroom is coming, let us not be those who are caught crying, crying at midnight. Because it's going to be very sad for us who, when we had a chance to be those wise virgins, to be the crying virgins, the foolish virgins. Let us be giving the midnight cry. Let us, each and every one of us, be given the midnight cry that Jesus is about to step out of the most holy place. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us close out in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for your kindness, for your patience with us. And we know, Father, that as the farmer waits for the crop to ripen, you are waiting for a people who will be ripened, who will be hewn and quartered, ready to fit into the heavenly garner. We desire to have the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We desire to be the people who you can trust with your oracles, and you can trust in heaven to live next door to angels, to be able to be trusted, Lord, for eternity. And that's longer than any of us can even imagine. But we desire to be a part of that. But most importantly, Father, we desire to say, Jesus, thank you so much for coming, suffering, bleeding, shedding your blood on our behalf, on Calvary, that we may have a chance to the tree of life. We thank you for sending Jesus and his, his ministry here and his administrative work in the most holy place on our behalf. Now we ask as we enter into this night, this evening of prayer, that you will be with each and every one of us and that you will be with our families, and that you will be with all in the sphere of our influence. We thank you for hearing our prayers and the answers that will come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.